What's up, Internet? Welcome to Once Over. I'm Kaylee, and today we're going to be giving the Once Over to five movies from 1991 that I think you probably missed. Give it a good Once Over. Giving us the Once Over. Giving him the Once Over. For Give me a Once Over. Down to give us the Once Over. For a routine Once Over. Once Over. Oh, just Once Over lightly. I've been really enjoying doing this series, so I hope you guys have been enjoying it too. This is where we talk about five movies from a particular year that I think are truly incredible movies, but you probably didn't see them. So you're gonna have to let me know which ones you have seen, what movies you think I missed from 1991. I know I miss a lot of shit, so please let me know. I would love to hear about it in the comments down below. And while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe. There, I did it. I said the words that I'm supposed to say. I don't like those words. They make me feel weird. So usually when I do these year reviews, I have no rhyme or reason whatsoever about why I picked the year that I picked, but this time I sort of do. The reason that I picked 1991 is because I actually just talked with Cradle to the Grave podcast all about the movie Popcorn, and Popcorn is the first movie on my list. And whose fault was that, huh? <gasps> whose fault was that? Nasty Suzanne. Nasty Suzanne and her nasty gun. Bang, bang, my nasty Suzanne. Bang, bang! Popcorn is a slasher film directed by Mark Harrier, who is actually Billy from Porky's. Has anybody seen my card? <laughs> <laughs> and written by Alan Ormsby, who you might know because he worked with Bob Clark a lot. Bob Clark, of course, did Black Christmas and a ton of other amazing shit. With Ormsby being affiliated with this film, I would think that it would be a little bit more well-known, but whenever I talk about like the late 80s, early 90s slasher films with people, they seem to have not seen this one. The plot follows a group of kids who are organizing an all-night horror movie marathon. I look like a fucking snow cone. <laughs> Which, of course, that already speaks to my love and um, affection of the horror movies. And, of course, they are being stalked and murdered by a deranged killer. The genius of this movie that sets it apart from other slasher films is that it has films within a film sequence because we are at a horror movie marathon. This is really amazing because they make references a lot to William Castle, who did promotional gags that we've talked about um, when I did my review of The Tingler. Don't be embarrassed about opening your mouth and letting rip with all you've got, because the person in the seat right next to you will probably be screaming too. We have little nods to things like Emerjo, which was Bill Castle's um, gag for House on Haunted Hill when he had a little skeleton fly across the way. In this movie, we have a mosquito going across the way. Bye -bye. But in the 90s, we started getting into all of these films that started to draw inspiration from the history of horror. This film in particular really draws a lot of inspiration from the 1950s, and I think that that is so cool. All of the meta 90s slasher films, Scream being the best and most prevalent example, I think are incredible. Jesus Christ, you don't know the rules? Uh, have an aneurysm, why don't you? There are certain rules that one must abide by in order to successfully survive a horror movie. For instance, number one, you can never have sex. <laughs> Next up, we have Breathing Fire. Do you want to watch a movie where Short Round from Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom kicks some butt in an uplifting martial arts B-movie? Of course you do. You would have to be insane not to want to watch this. This movie was actually gifted to me by Brandon and Mandy, who are fans of Who Are These Podcasts, and I got to meet them in Largo, Florida. They gave me a copy of this, and they also gave a copy to Carl and Jenny Jingles. All of us just loved it. This movie is so, so great. <laughs> I actually watched and talked about this movie with Andy Q Public on our Thursday matinee show, which we do over on Twitch. I will link the information about that down below. We're always doing lots of fun stuff over there. I don't even know how to describe how incredible this movie is because it is just that incredible. Hey, watch this. Robocop. You should get your hands on this and you should watch it. It's just martial arts fun times. <laughs> Yeah. 
Thank you again, Brandon and Mandy, for introducing me to it. Up next, we have Ruben and Ed. This is a weird buddy comedy directed by Trent Harris and starring Crispin Glover and Howard Hessman. I gotta admit that's true. I don't have to admit that. You have to admit that. No, I don't. Yes, you do. I don't have to admit anything. You have to admit there's hair no, on your head. No, yes, I don't. you do. No, but I you don't. have to admit that. No, I don't. But you have to admit your cat's dead. He's deader than a doornail. We're gonna get this out of the way first. I am in love with Crispin Glover. Even if you haven't seen this film, you might be aware of it because Glover did a very famous rendition of his character in a 1987 appearance on Letterman when he was promoting his other film, River's Edge. During the interview, Glover wore platform shoes, a wig, and behaved very erratically, including almost kicking Letterman in the head. In my opinion, it's a little bit of a shame that he missed. Letterman did not get the joke. Nobody got the joke. For years, everybody just thought that Glover was insane, which I kind of think that he is, which is one of the reasons that I like him. He lives in a castle in the Czech Republic with peacocks. Anyways, that's not important. Letterman thought that he had completely lost it, but really he was likely doing his character Ruben from this movie. This movie is eclectic and quirky, but it is often criticized for its lack of narrative. However, I will happily sacrifice narrative if that means that I get to enjoy Ruben in a trippy dream sequence featuring a perfectly reasonable platform shoes and also this cat. The character of Ruben also appears in Glover's music video for Clowny Clown Clown. I'm so in love with Crispin Glover. Can we also just talk for a second about his dance in Friday the 13th, the final chapter? <laughs> Hi Crispin. I'd get a boob job if you wanted to be with me. I think he likes girls with boob jobs. Anyways, I got a little distracted there, apologies. Our next movie is going to be Delicatessen. This is a French post-apocalyptic sci-fi black comedy directed by Jean-Pierre Junet. It was Junet's first feature-length film, but you might be more familiar with his later works, which include Amelie, Micmacs, and Alien Resurrection. Actually, I think Micmacs gets really overlooked also. That movie is also really, really, really great. Don't judge him on Alien Resurrection. It's gonna be okay, guys. Just watch Delicatessen. I think that most most people have seen Amelie, and I also saw Amelie before I saw Delicatessen. I was kind of thinking that I was going into like a drippy romance film, but I was very wrong. It's a surrealistic look at the post-apocalyptic world where food is in short supply, and an unemployed ex-circus clown arrives in this town and rents a dilapidated apartment from a butcher landlord who occasionally prepares a delicacy for his odd tenants. Why do you have to wash that awful taste out of my mouth? Mountain Dew or crab juice? Ugh! Oh, jeez! I'll take a crab juice. It's been said that this film is essential viewing for vegetarians. This movie is equally, if not more, clever than his later works, and I think that it is just whimsical and beautiful. It's hard to sell whimsy in a bleak futuristic dystopia, so it really succeeds. And finally we have Guilty as Charged. It's a comedy. I like comedies sometimes. Alright, it's a little bit of a dark comedy. I have never met anybody who has seen this movie. You should watch this movie immediately if you haven't already. It was directed by Sam Irvin and it stars Rod Steiger and Laura Hutton, who you might recognize as the Countess from Once Bitten. It's obviously the only place that you would know her from. It's a dark comedy where a vigilante who, with the aid of his helper, Isaac Hayes, captures men who he considers to be evil and then executes them in his homemade electric chair. We also get some amazing performances by Heather Graham and Zelda Rubinstein. I'll admit that the production values aren't great on this one, but the content is so good that it doesn't even matter. This film skewers everyone. We take hits at right-wing death penalty advocates, at bleeding heart liberals, at politicians, at self-righteous religious people, and at incorrigible criminals. The movie has a great surprise high voltage ending. The acting in this film allows us to see characters as funny, sad, sweet, righteous, malevolent, a little bit of everything in every single scene that they're in, which really connects you to every single thing that's going on, even though it is a goofy premise. If you want a good laugh, that is the one to check out. I mean, unless you want a good laugh at hilarious martial arts from the 90s with Short Round, in which case it's breathing fire. Or if you want to watch a funny cat, Reuben and Ed, or hilarious butchery, in which case delicatessen or popcorn. 
We did a lot of comedies for 1991. I don't usually get super into comedies, but clearly I was just feeling it. These are all weird comedies, but I think that they all fall within the vein. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it, and I can't wait to see you in the next one. Bye!